Hi, and welcome to our CSA Digital Summit. And our session for today is customer expectation, surprise and facts about duality in people inboxes. My name is Maike and I'm responsible for the marketing at the Certified Senders Alliance, especially for the CSA Email Summit and the CSA Digital Email Summit this year. Maybe you are wondering now who's the Certified Senders Alliance and what we do all day long. Um, I just want to give you a brief overview about the CSA. Um, we have been in the market now more than 15 years. We have more than 100 certified senders and we're working together with mailbox providers and technology partners. Our goal is to increase the quality of commercial emailing. To achieve these goals, we create enable quality standards in the email marketing. We don't do this alone. We do this in cooperation with our partners so that we have the CSA email summit since 2014 now. This year, of course, only digital. I know that we have a lot of attendees today who joined the last webinars, but I just want to give you a brief overview about the housekeeping rules for today. Please know that you're muted during the whole webinar, so if you have any questions, just submit them to the organizer. It's me today. I will collect all the questions and then read them at the out read them out loud at the end of the session so that Connie and Anna can answer them. So, yes. So, as I mentioned before, we have two speakers for today. It's Connie and also Anna. They both working uh, they both are working for the uh, for one for eins and eins. Connie is the expert data driven and Anna is the head of email security. I don't want to go too deep into detail um, about the content about the webinar today. I know that they both will do it right away. So I wish you a lot of fun, a lot of new knowledge, and you will hear and see me at the end of the session. Welcome, everyone. As Michael already mentioned, we want to talk to you today about customer expectations. And as some of you might already be aware of, um, Arne and I, we work for one and one million media, which um, is Germany's largest email provider, um, and we have brands such as GMX and WebDE, and so we are a mailbox provider, but of course we are aware that there are many more mailbox providers out there. And so this is just a brief collection of the largest and most well-known ones. Um, so having all these brands as mailbox providers, um, we know that the user has the choice, and we know they can choose between all these different brands, and and choosing a mailbox provider is a long-term investment. Like you usually keep your mailbox, like your main mailbox for a long time. Um, and so you should really make this decision very deliberately. And so it's similar to like buying a house maybe or buying a car. People contemplate these decisions for a long time, but it's it's not necessarily the same with email, even though you keep them maybe even longer than, than your car or than your house. Um, and email is like a really important part of your life. It's Sometimes some services, you can't even use them without an, ID, without an email address because it's some kind of an ID to use the service. So email is very important. We all know that. Um, but as much as it might hurt all of us to know that, people usually don't care as much. That's just one of the quotes from our customers. I don't think much about email. It just needs to work. So email is a commodity. People don't think about email as much as they do about other long-term investments. Um, but we, we care a lot and we want to um, make email work for the user because the user just wants it to work and so we want to make it work for the user. But not just for us and not just for the customer, but for the entire ecosystem. Like you guys all know that email, there's a, an entire ecosystem like the senders and um, the, the email service providers and the mailbox providers. And so all this ecosystem needs to work and so or wants to, we want it to work and so email as a medium should work. And so we all need to work together to make it work for the user. So today, Anna and I want to show you a glimpse into what we know about our users and how they use email and how they want email, want to use email. And also we want to like, just make the case we should all to make users fall back in love with email because they don't right now, as you can see from this quote right here. So let's jump right into the mailbox. Um, making email work for the user is really hard because the users are not all the same. Like our brands have about 40 million users 
And so there's all different kinds of users. There are the, the very organized ones, as you see in the screenshots, like they have all these folders that are user defined and they even might use filters or um, some kind of rules that sort emails into different folders. So they are the really organized ones. And then there are other users that are completely different. They just um, follow the inbox zero approach. They just want to get everything done and just have nothing to do left in their email inbox. And then the total opposite again is the ones that just let everything go into their inbox and rely heavily on search to find everything they need. And some of them even like, like this user, for example, here, they, they even sort of declare email bankruptcy where they just, they just don't look at their email regularly. They just, if they want to, if they needed something really bad, then they would look in their mailbox and, and find it, but they don't, keep it, like do the upkeep and keep the mailbox up to date as they maybe should. Um, and so these types are you. So Michael will start a quick poll to ask you guys, which of these concepts do you actively use in your private email account? Is it the user-defined folders? And you can check more than one answer. Like you can use user-defined folders and still follow inbox zero. Um, so I'd really like to know, and then I'll tell you how our users um, compare. Okay, we are already up to almost 50% voted. So we'll wait a few more seconds until maybe 70 or 80% of you guys cast your votes and then we'll see the results. All right, there's already a really clear winner here. Um, thank you for participating. So we have more than half that use user-defined folders and like one fifth of you guys uses the inbox zero approach and then <laughs> <laughs> There's even 23% that already declared email bankruptcy, which is not a bad thing. Like uh, the email clients have the tools to deal with that even. So that's very interesting. Um, thank you so much. And so now I'll tell you how our users compare. And so here we had user defined folders. Um, you said 57%. That's interestingly very different for our users. There's less than 5% of our users that use user defined folders. So you guys are but <laughs> you are sort of email professionals, so um, that's, maybe why, that's maybe why it is different. Um, inbox zero, um, we can't really measure that because having a zero inbox could either mean you are very organized or you don't use this mail account at all. So we don't have data for that as, as much. But then the last group that just lets everything go to the inbox uh, and or has declared email bankruptcy, that's up to 50% of our users and that, compares really well with what we just saw in the poll where um, it says, well, you said 23% uh, email bankruptcy, but some of them, and even, if, even if you don't use email bankruptcy, you still might just let everything go to the inbox because if you don't use user-defined folders, then everything's in the inbox. So that's 43% um, of you guys. So that's, like very different, um, very different ways of using email, very different um, requirements and expectations for the, the mail client to, to, to serve your needs. And so there's even more components to that. So if we dive deeper into the mailbox, we can now look at what email actually arrives in your inbox or <laughs> wants to arrive in your inbox because not everything does. And so we see the typical in incoming stream of emails here and we can see that like half of it is already just unwanted it's spam it's phishing it's just unwanted mail um, and it's about 50 percent it's not the same for every mailbox of course and then another large share is wanted commercial emails so that's your shopping mails your newsletter your promotions and then a smaller share is the wanted non-commercial emails so that's um, maybe like the real person-to-person -person communication and all other types of emails. Oh yeah, we talked about all these ones. Um, but then of, of course, the, the separation between these categories is not that clear. Like where's the line dividing wanted non-commercial and wanted commercial? So is a social media notification that someone liked your 
a LinkedIn post, is that commercial or non-commercial? It's, it's sort of in between. And the same is for spam or not spam. Not everyone agrees of, um, of definition. Like my, some users might already consider it spam, where others said it's wanted commercial. So it's not that clear. And Arne will go into much more detail about um, these, these separations and these distinctions. Um, but for now, let's actually look more in depth um, at the wanted part. So Anna will go more into the unwanted part, but the other half is, is wanted email and they, we, this part we can separate out even further. So this is all our wanted emails. And then if we look at the percentages right here, um, a small percentage of um, all the wanted email is conversations. And conversations are these emails where real human beings email other real human beings. Um, and that's, if you remember the good old days, um, that's what email was supposed to be like in the beginning. Um, so just people emailing people. And so now it's like a really small share of all the emails. Um, and the job to be done there would be just, you know, read the email and it's probably a really important email. You want to maybe or hopefully you look forward to receiving this email and then even answering it. But that's not true for all the other email categories that we find in this pie. So another email category would be shopping email. So you order something in an online shop and then they send you, on average, we think about five emails for each shopping transaction. So once you order something, there's this like a sequence of like the order confirmation and then the shipment confirmation, shipment updates, and then your shipment has now arrived and what did you, would, would you want to review your products? And so shopping is very different from the conversations share of this pie in that it's first of all, it's email um, made by computers. So it's not, not a really human being that sent you this email. And it's also a, a larger share. And you're not necessarily like waiting for this email or looking forward to it. And also in terms of when is this email important, it's, it's important in the beginning once you receive it. And then maybe after a week or two, it, it's, you don't care about this email much anymore. And um, so it's a different job to be done. You just look at it, you register, okay, the order is, is confirmed, and then you really don't care about the emails as much anymore. And maybe then once the, the system or the, once the, the ordered item breaks in like half a year or so, then maybe you want to find the email again. So just in terms of time, when is the email important? That's very different from conversations. And then another large share of the wanted email is the promotional newsletters. Like that's the largest share in all inboxes, maybe 60% on average. That's just made up out of newsletters. And so again, very different jobs to be done are just looking at it when you're in the right frame of mind. Like we all try, like we don't, but um, newsletter senders try to um, time, make the, do the timing, have the timing right when the email arrives. So they have all these different algorithms to find out when to send an email so that catches the, the receiver at the, at the perfect time to be in the right set of mind to open the email. But still, um, it's a large share of emails that you not necessarily wait for or look forward to. And so um, it's, it's complicated. We'll, we'll, get in, we'll get in, go into more details about newsletter because it's a complicated relationship between the receivers of the newsletters um, and how they, how they want to handle it. Um, but then again, for newsletters, um, like the, the time frame when they are interesting, they're only interesting for like the first week or two. And then you could almost, we don't do that, of course, but you could almost delete them after a certain time because they just expire. They're not, they're not relevant anymore at all. And then quite to the contrary are contract emails, like for your subscriptions or even some, some kind of online contracts like your electricity or your mobile phone. These emails you, you never want to delete. These are probably the most important emails because they have like contracts in them and then proof of purchase and um, all the different like the terms and conditions of your contract. So you really need these emails like all over the time as long as the contract runs and maybe even afterwards if you want to compare what was my previous rate at the, at the old, old provider compared to my current rate. So these are emails that are very important for a very long time. And so I'm just telling you all this to, to show that there's, there's all these different things in your inbox and they all have very different jobs to be done and they all land in the same inbox. And so um, this, it's a really mix of, of different purposes. Another share, this is very different from mailbox to mailbox, like social emails, all these Facebook and Twitter and, and 
again, LinkedIn updates, if someone liked your post or wants to be your friend or whatever, like some mailboxes don't have any social mails at all because they manage the notifications and other mailboxes have these emails. And if they have it, this, it's a really large share. It's like hundreds and hundreds of mails um, just from these social platforms. Um, and then lastly, there's just this, let's call it long tail, like other emails. Um, we haven't explored that much, that one too much. We, we definitely know it, contain, it contains travel emails like hotel reservations and, and flight bookings. And also all these, these digests, like a weekly or, or monthly digest of, of, of news sources or whatever you subscribe to. And then forum mails and then just a different long tail of each mailbox is different, of course. So if you have like a, a sports group that you go to and maybe they, or look right now, if the, all the homeschooling going on, maybe you have a homeschooling parents group that email each other. Well, that would be in conversations, I guess, but um, there's, a, there's different mails that you could put into other that are present in your mailbox, but maybe not in other people's mailboxes. So it's very heterogeneous. And so for each group of emails, people have different expectations of, of what they want these emails, these emails to look like or what they want to do with these emails. And so just, just, that's just what I want to keep you in mind, what, what I want you to keep in mind that it's, it's just the jobs to be done are very different for each email. Um, and so once we look at that, it's no wonder people all often say, I lost control of my inbox because they have, this inbox and then the context switching between all these different categories when, when they look through their emails in the inbox is, is very hard and so it's very easy to get the feeling to be overwhelmed and, and just losing control or not even wanting to deal with it because remember we said that they just wanted to work they, they don't care about email they really just wanted to work and so with all this 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 work to maintain an inbox and with all these different contexts in the inbox it's it's really hard to just let it go and not take care of it and so it's really something that becomes a source of work is something that needs to be maintained just like you need to clean your house or to put gas into your car so you need to maintain your inbox and so that's why it becomes annoying and that's why people lose control because it's not something they want to do and so that's why we want to help with that. And we want to make email work for the user, um, just as I explained again in the beginning, because we all want email as a medium to survive and to, to thrive even. And so we want to help users with that. And so what we wanted to do is just have a mailbox that serves the user's needs. And we identified two different um, purposes, basically, or goals that we want to achieve. So of course, on the right side, we want, we want the user to spot new important emails immediately. Like, if you, for example, applied for a job, that's something else that's in the other category I showed before. If you apply to a job, you're waiting for, for, for the confirmation for your interview, for example, or if, you, if you're looking for a new house or a new apartment, you're waiting for these automatic digests. There are new apartments in your search area. Look at them now before anyone else does. And so you're, these are the emails that you really wait for and you want to see them right away. And so if you get a notification that you got a new email, these are the emails that you want to see, and maybe the, the next promotional newsletter wouldn't be something you want to be wouldn't you would want to be notified about. And on the other side, we have um, the goal to just quickly retrieve inf important information. And note that I I didn't even say email. We just want you to retrieve relevant information. So, for example, about your contracts or about your shopping experience. You wouldn't really you don't need the email that some computer sent you, you would just want the information that's, that's, that's encoded in the email and just one or two words, basically. And so to summarize all that, we really just want quickly find what you need when you, when you need it. And that's our goal. And so I'm, I'm going to go into a little bit of detail about how we did that for, for just three quick examples. But there's three things that we, that we try to do to to help with that. So we wanted to build a focused inbox. So you're not distracted. There's no clutter in your inbox. It's really just the email that you're waiting for, the email that's important to you at the right time. And then we also did category overviews. So a category, I'll, I'll show you a little bit later, but the category would, for example, be the contract emails. And then we also want to just provide smart services at the right time to help you and to assist you with the email just so to make the job a little bit easier because we just want people to save time and have the peace of mind that they don't miss an important email, but also don't waste time just maintaining their inbox because that's no fun at all. And so that's again where you guys come in um, because 
starting with just a focused inbox, we wanted to build a focused inbox for users, but first we had to get to know our users and ask them because Again, we, we ask them about newsletters because that's, as we saw, the biggest share. About 60% of the mailbox are just newsletters, promotional newsletters. And so we asked the users, I would like my newsletters in a dedicated folder in the inbox or both in the inbox and the dedicated folder. So I'm turning the question to you now. How would you like to see your newsletters in your private mailbox? And results are coming in fast and there's a clear winner already, but we'll wait again until about 70 or 80 percent have cast their vote. Thank you guys so much. It really helps to know that you guys are out there because it's it's just like I'm talking to myself here. Also, yeah, I didn't really get my webcam to work with the go to meeting, so that's why it's radio today. I'm so sorry. Okay, five more percent. Okay, so that's interesting. It's again, it's it's a, bit, a little, bit, little bit different from what we found from our users, but so you guys, the majority of you guys really want the newsletters in a dedicated folder. And I'm with you, I'm totally with you there. I, I really like that solution as well. And then there's still one third that, or almost one third that wants them in the inbox and then 18% that wants them in both places. Okay, thank you so much. So now we'll look at what our users said. When we ask them the same question. And they were split exactly half and half with having them or wanting them in the dedicated wanting wanting them in the dedicated folder and wanting them in the inbox. And then there was a much smaller share than, than you guys right now that wanted them in both the inbox and the dedicated folder. But um so again <laughs> looking at this survey, that's really like, okay, what do we do now? It's like half and half. But still we moved ahead and I'll show you what we did. Um, let me see if I'm still sharing my screen. Okay, I do. Okay, so again, here we have the pie we saw before with all these categories. And I'm, I'm aware of that these categories sort of, it's just one way of um, separating out an inbox. There's lots of different ways of separating out the different emails that arrive in each inbox. But just based on analyzing the jobs to be done and also the we, we try to identify large shares of the inbox that are present for many users and we're trying to find a, find a solution for each of these categories. And so that's why we, we made the split that we did, but I'm aware of that it's not like the godsend, one and only split there is in the world. Um, but so that's why that's why we, we decided to split mailboxes in this way. And in our clients, we, we made like a category or a dedicated folder, which, which is really just a view. It's not actually a user defined folder. It's just a view of the emails. And we made for each of the categories one view. So you can see new user that's right there. And then Bestellungen is orders and then social media and Unterhaltungen, that's, that's conversations. And <clears throat> so we separated out, as you can see, new setters here, we separated out the new setters, but then by having this so we so by having this 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 the, the, the topmost folder that's called Allgemein, that's where we we try to basically um, satisfy both user requests. So we we left the inbox as it is. So new setters are mixed still in the inbox, but then we made this this category Allgemein, which has just the important emails without the new setters. So we try to satisfy both. Um, user groups because they were split in half. But so you have a dedicated view for your newsletters and you still have them in your inbox if you want to, or you have the focused view in Allgemein where you can see all the important emails and no newsletters and no social media. So that's what we did for the for the categories. And then let's look um, a little bit, little bit more into detail on what we did with the newsletter category. So we have the smart, <coughs> we, 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 all the grouping is it's the, the whole grouping thing we called a smart inbox so that's why it says intelligent post at the top but then we have this new set of category right here and if you click on it you just see a list of email and each email is a new setter and it has like this small smart service on top that you can see right here it says it's a new setter and then it has a link which says new setter abbestellen which is unsubscribe new setter and it's a button and so not only did we separate out the newsletters and make a dedicated category so you can see all the newsletters when you are in the right frame of mind to do so and when you are in the mood to deal with your newsletters, but we also gave the users an easy option 
um, to unsubscribe newsletters because that's what we um, actually identified as, as the biggest pain point for our users. They were really overwhelmed with too many newsletters that they didn't really subscribe to. And so we gave them an easy option to unsubscribe from newsletters. And we discovered that people really, they were happy about this option because they said, um, or they went, they didn't say that they just showed it with the actions. They went on like unsubscribing, unsubscribing sessions where once they unsubscribe from one newsletter, then in the same session on the, in their client, they unsubscribe from, from two to three more newsletters in the same session. Just like cleaning up your inbox. Now is the time. Uh, clean your bathroom real quick and then clean up your inbox real quick as well. Um, but it's not all bad news and Anna will go into more detail why this is actually good news um, if, they be, if they unsubscribe because they only, what we discovered is they only unsubscribe from, from newsletters that they really didn't read anyway. And they, 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 were, they, they have some newsletters that they're really in love with and they want to keep them. And they only unsubscribe from the ones that they say they didn't really sign up for them at all or that they have content that they haven't been interested in for a long time. And so we give them the option. Um, but also giving newsletters this dedicated space where they are out of the way from like your more important emails, it made people feel like they don't have the need to unsubscribe as much from newsletters because now they're not cluttering the inbox. Now they are, they have their dedicated space and they can dedicate time to newsletters if they are in the right sort of mind. And so that actually made it so that people wanted to unsubscribe less because they said, now they're out of the way. Now I can deal with newsletters in another way. So we actually helped people not be as annoyed because yeah, people do have a love-hate relationship with newsletters. They want to keep them, but they're annoying in the inbox. They, they, they keep them from, from finding important emails fast. And so that's why just having the separate view is really a, a, a good thing for us all. And so one of the best statements also that that's where I'm getting at right now is people also said, I don't care if it's a block or an unsubscribe. I just want the news that are gone. So because we ask them, what do you think? What, what happens when you when you press this um, this button? You said unsubscribe, and they said, I don't care what happens. I just want to see it anymore. Is it unsubscribe? Is it just you block it? I don't care. And so that's the thing. Again, users don't care, but we do. So the user doesn't care how it's done, but we should care. So in terms of expectations versus reality. Um, of course, people like our users just expect us to to, like, to serve them basically. So if if we if we offer an unsubscribe, they don't want the newsletter ever again. So if the newsletter sender provides an easy way to unsubscribe, we'll use that. And then it's it's a it's a normal unsubscribe, and then the email is gone. But if the sender doesn't provide an easy unsubscribe as per CSA guidelines for example, then we've had, we have to find another way of blocking this email. And so then we can't do the unsubscribe. We have to do a block. But because if we don't, people will again, people will just send the email to spam because they don't want to see it. They don't care how they just want it out of their way. And so that's why we really like want to tell you guys and want to want to ask you guys to just use all the means that, that we have agreed on within the CSA to just offer an easy unsubscribe because we as a mailbox provider, we just want to meet customer expectations and the customer expectations is they want it gone. And so the earlier in the process, the better. So if you provide, if you don't send emails in the first place without having a double opt-in or without asking the users, that's the best. And then once the user subscribed, provide an easy unsubscribe because if you don't, we need to block the email or we need to have it sent to spam because the user wants it to. So the earlier in the process, the better. So we should care about how we serve our newsletters and how we serve our emails to the users. And then just looking at one more category, that's the shopping category. Um, <clears throat> so we separated also out all the emails that are shopping emails. And so here it becomes, um, that's what I talked about, the category overviews um, before really briefly. And so for shopping, we did a category overview and um, it's it's a German email client, so everything's in German, but basically all the different um, sections you see in this mailbox, um, each section is one order. So it's not an email, but it's a, it's a meta view where you just group all the emails by by sender and basically group orders together. And so we provided this view for the user because um, we learned that they didn't really care about the email, they just wanted the information. And so we have a, a, 
individual tracking of the packages. So if, if it's a physical order that you made, um, you can see the, the tracking um, progress. And then also you have an easy link to all the emails that concern this order. So you have this meta view, but then you can also jump into all the emails that make up this order. But again, here, when you think in terms of, of customer expectations, they just want this all to work. And they, they, for them, it's just part of the order process also. That's like last year, we talked more in, at the CSA Summit about um, all this, what I'm showing right now. But users just see this as part of the order um, pro, pro process. And one of the uh, more funny um, discoveries we made that is that um, users really didn't distinguish that they are now in an email program. So when we ask them, so this is an order overview. And when we ask them what they think about the order overview, they see the, the feedback link at the top. And people gave us like really good feedback about the feature, but they also gave us feedback about the, the, the products they purchased. So they said the pants fit well, the TV has great color, just to and because they didn't really know that they are now in the email program and that they're not with the brand they purchased from. And so why am I telling you this? It's, it's for the user, it's all just one big experience. And so every positive experience reflects well on all of us, like the entire email ecosystem from the sender, from, from the brand to the sender, to the, to the mailbox provider. And so it's, it's also true vice versa. So every bad experience reflects bad on all of us. So that's, again, we need just to work together too have a good experience for the user. Um, and going into more detail, just a little bit, um, if you get, if you look at each individual email, um, no, let me start that over. <laughs> you have this, 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 you have this order overview and on the top, you see if we have all information, like the Esprit order, we have all the information we need to, sh to, to, ma to make a good experience for the user and to show them all the information they need. But at the bottom, we are lacking information. We are lacking the carrier. We couldn't, in the email, we couldn't extract or we couldn't find what the carrier is for this particular order and this particular package. So that's why we can't really provide the perfect experience to the user. So that's why you don't see like the DHL logo or the DPD logo that tells you who is sending the package. And so that's something that's not customer expectation. That's more in terms of our expectations. We were hoping or expecting that every email would give us all the information we need to provide the perfect experience to the user. But that's not the case. Not all emails contain all the information we need. Some emails don't contain the carrier. Some emails don't even contain like an order number so we can so we can provide the group the group view you, you, you see here. And so um we're just trying to provide whatever we can to give a good experience to the user. Um, but again, we went into more detail last year about this, but here we would really encourage you, if you are an online shop and if you are a sender, please provide all these informations. And we have on the last slide, there's resources to help you with that. Um, we use schema.org as a um, standard to um, catch all these information. And so we really encourage you to use that to give us all the information to provide just the perfect experience for our users. And this is just the individual view of one email. So that's like a, send, um, a shipment confirmation from um, like a pet store. And so at the top, we have this, this large section, which we call smart service, which gives you all the digest of the information. You don't even need to read the email anymore. You just need to digest up top. Um, but that shifts us a little bit. And that's, that's a really important thing and a really interesting thing that it shifts us from just being a mailbox provider to like, giving more legit legitimacy to some emails than to others, because we recognize this is a real shopping email and we recognize that we want to give you more information about it. And so you trust us with that information, of course. And so we take that very seriously. And Anna will next go into much more detail about what what we're trying to do to um, really serve that, that need and really um, serve the user in, in just legitimizing these emails. And then just really briefly to pour contracts, we did the same thing, just this meta view for all your co contracts and subscriptions. So you can see here all the different providers we have for your like for your finances, for your insurances, and for your electricity and mobile phone. And then again, it's just a meta view. And if you click on any one of those, um, you are in the email view again and you see all these emails for the different um for the different for the for the one provider that you selected um again here we had, it's not even it's it's not it almost doesn't look like a regular email program so it's the really customer expectation here is really you just see the email from the from the energy provider and just see all the information that you need to know about that 
And so with this view, I would uh, hand over to Arne, um, if I can, I can give him mouse and keyboard privileges. Um, so he can take you more on a journey about how we take our, our quest seriously to only show legitimate emails in this. So Arne should know, you should now have pri privileges to move the email, uh, move yes. the mouse. Uh, do I? It looks so. Oh, I'm sorry. Ah, does it? <laughs> no worries. If you, so, I click, yeah. so if you click, then yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, thanks, Connie. And um, I'm very happy to uh, uh, take this uh, from now. And um, like Connie said, uh, customers really uh, trust us and expect us to show the right things, especially if you have a specific views like this one. So imagine you are uh, a WebDE customer, so you're, do, uh, you're doing uh, your annual text statement and then you search up uh, for some contracts and you find the one from your local energy provider. But uh, what if one of this is not an email that is actually coming from this um, uh, from this energy provider, but uh, for instance, is a phishing mail. This would be a nightmare for customers and would be the worst case um, because uh, it, like I said, they trust us to do the right thing and um, to have a successful phishing campaign, uh, you need two, thing, uh, two things. Um, a, you need to defeat our systems. You have to, to get the mail in and into sight of the customer. So not in the spam folder, but in some different view or in the inbox. And B, the customer needs also to be defeated. Um, uh, they are not dumb, um, but in such special views, they really, they think this is a legit email, they click on it, and then maybe they are getting uh, trapped by a phishing mail, which would which would be not good. And of course, customers um, ask us, uh, um, can't you just detect that phishing? Why, why can't you? If there is phishing, we get feedback for that. And the truth is, it's it's hard. Um, um, if if you as a sender or as a brand uh, don't do your job uh, for that, and I will come to that in some minutes, um, it's really hard. Of course, we can apply every filtering possible. We can apply machine learning models that try to figure out an email is pretending to be from PayPal, but isn't. Um, but it's really hard, and it will always be a cat and mouse race. So it would be much better if if you are also in the interest to protect your your brand or your or the customers that send with their brand through your systems um, from being fished and the answer for that we all know is um, authentication and especially DMARC yeah and I want to give you a short overview about the state of authentication at WebD and GMX um, so um, luckily only 13 percent of all mail that we receive inbound um, has no DKIM at all and 52% uh, uh, has at, at least DKIM. And already 35% of the email by volume, um, they have a, a DMARC policy, which is um, quarantine or reject. So on, on this amount of traffic, we can and we will um, um, act on behalf of the, um, of the sender, so to protect the brands and to respect the policy. And this uh, this helps us a lot in protecting our customers from phishing, especially if you think back to that uh, to that special view where so we just filter out some of the senders, uh, some of the brands and put them together. And especially here, uh, DMARC would be the best solution uh, to just pick the right emails. Um, but um, um, it, this is by traffic, like I mentioned, but if you look deeper into the portion of traffic that has already a DMARC a policy that we could apply, it, it turns out that only 3% of all domains coming in having that policy, which really means um, a lot of brands don't have that protection in place. And it also shows that especially the bigger senders or bigger brands uh, more likely uh, to have a policy, which of course makes sense because bigger brands like PayPal is a very famous one, um, uh, is often subject to phishing. Um, but as, uh, if you think of your local energy provider or your local telco or whatever, it might not be the case that this rather smaller sender um, has a DMARC policy in place, um, which would make it more hard to detect it. Um, so in order to meet the expectations of stop phishing, we implemented or we 
in the face of implementing DMARC, to be correct, and this helps us uh, a lot in, in um, not showing false emails into uh, um, into that views. And we also consider in in only putting emails in that views where we have strong authentication, where we have enough signals that we can trust to put only the right email into it. And I cannot say it often enough. DMARC is the key here, which would help us. And um, if we don't have enough signals on an on a mail, we probably uh, will consider to rather not put it in a special view in order to protect our customers. Um, but I talked a lot about phishing and a lot about really uh, threats that are very harmful uh, to our customers. But like um, Connie already mentioned, it's not all about this. So I want to step back a little and uh, talk uh, a little bit about the big portion of um, commercial email that, that uh, our customers receive. And I want to give you a short real life example from myself. So. I recently ordered some some stuff for my espresso machine, and I for sure got the got the package with the right content in it. I got the products I needed, but I also got a lot of advertising I really don't ask for. Um, in this case, it's annoying. I really don't need all these kind of watchers or uh, the catalog. Um, I just needed uh, the, the products I ordered. Um, so I uh, uh, throw them into the trash uh, without giving any further meanings to them besides making this picture to show you. So I think you you already get the feeling of what direction I want uh, to head now because you can find similar similar stuff within email inboxes. Uh, you order something, uh, you do something, and then you end up with a lot of email that comes in addition to what you try to achieve. And that's the meme for, for my talk now. And um, especially if you look uh, on sweepstakes, lotteries, price comparison, deals, all that stuff, uh, this is one of the main sources uh, we figured out uh, that uh, that lead to often unwanted email afterwards. Because you don't really know as a, as a user, if you do a price game, you don't really know um, what, what's happened afterwards. You hope that maybe you will uh, win a Amazon voucher uh, but you are probably also aware of that this is very unlikely because a lot of people are doing this price game. Uh, but uh, what's what's for sure that you will end up with a lot of uh, commercial email hitting hitting your mailbox. I don't want to talk about whether price games price comparison is good or not, whether there are legal or illegal ones. It's just a team that that customers really don't uh, don't understand where all that email is come from. And I did the test for myself. Um, um, I signed up for some of uh, of sweepstakes um, in in order to prepare this talk. And um, it was roughly ten months ago where I created a mailbox. I did some lotteries and uh, I looked what happened. And as of last week, I received almost or over fifteen thousand newsletters or commercial email, like you can see here. And even though we already put most of them into the spam spam folder, um, there are a couple of thousand emails sitting around in my new set of view in this example, or even in my inbox. Um, so uh, it's a lot of email and a lot of people, they they, they have this, um, they, they see such such a lot of email coming from and they don't really know why they are getting it and the number one complaint we are receiving um, yeah we are receiving from our customers is in my inbox is just way too much spam or advertising and people don't distinguish really between spam they call everything spam they don't want they they don't remember that they did a, a, a price game or a price comparison or signed up for some weekly deals or whatever um, a while ago, they don't remember and then they even don't recognize that they are giving their opt-in to many, many advertising partners. So eventually the, uh, the inbox is just cluttered with all that email and then customers are complaining and they're complaining to us because they don't know the source, they complain to us. There's a lot of spam in my inbox, why don't you do something uh, uh, against it? And um, at this point, I'd uh, like uh, to state your question with a, with a question tool. Um, how many emails um, on average do you receive in your inbox per day? 
So what do you think a rough, uh, just a rough estimation, how many mails every day in your inbox, not the spam folder in your, really in your inbox per day? Oh, that's ramping up quickly. Oh, that's interesting. Interesting picture. Yeah, the, uh, like with the cases uh, of Connie's questions, uh, uh, what comes out is is different from what we get from our customers. So, thank you all. Um, you can see mo most of you, more than a half, get more than fifteen emails on average per day, and then with the rest of the options available, it's pretty even. So, uh, a lot of emails. If you if you if you think on every day. Um, information that hits your inbox it's quite a lot i think and um, thank you all um, and of course we did an analysis of uh, what our customers see in the inbox do i still have control yep um, so in 2019 um, we did an analysis and uh, on average uh, a customer receives a 13 email per day right in their uh, inbox. And at the time we also received a lot of customer complaints about getting too much spam and seeing too much advertising in their inbox. So we we did act on that. We, we started really to listen to the wishes of our customers and to their expectations to help them to get rid of, of emails they no longer want to have. And one of it, uh, Connie already show, uh, showed to you, it's a newsletter unsubscribed option. Um, since it is mandatory for CSA sender, uh, uh, really uh, most most of you uh, do it, and um, so a lot of newsletters are actually unsubscribable and uh, very easy with a single click. Uh, that information we can pull out of the email and place it into our mail product and then it's really easy for the customer and there's a 50 50 chance that uh, uh, the the customer uh, chooses uh, the newsletter unsubscribe over a spam button and even if he still clicks on the spam button um, then we re-ask um, we could unsubscribe you from that from that mailing very easy what what's your choice is it still spam or is it uh news that unsubscribe and then again it's 50 50. Uh, so really people uh, love this feature and we have um, we have uh, every day thousands of thousands of news that unsubscribes and uh, but this this is a good thing because the customer gets cleaned up their mailbox and so after uh, roughly 12 months um, with uh, uh, offering uh, news that unsubscribe but also uh, listen to the customers to find out what what mailings they like and what don't and to send the mailings they don't like to the spam folder instead of uh, placing them into the inbox and having a much more strict filtering on um, bike advertising mails uh, we managed to bring the average inbox uh, emails uh, to, down to eight uh, over the course of one year and uh, but it, really we get the signals from our customers that this this is the right thing and we put the right mates into the spam folder and the right mates into the inbox uh, because uh, over that 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 course of the year uh, we really managed to put down our spam complaints a lot almost 50 percent uh, less spam complaints especially in this case uh, on the csa traffic and uh, even in the same same course of time the no spam complaints um, we reduced uh, by 75 percent so people complain much less about having the email sorting in a wrong way um, and what we also can see that within this year um, people tend to read more email um, the percentage of mail they they read finding in their inbox uh, did go up by 10 percent points uh, but also we see it um, normalized to the traffic we see an absolute increase so really people people read more of their emails if they are not flood with emails in their inbox and if they are in the right mind and if the product supports them to find out what's important and if they are in the right mood they start to read newsletters from the newsletter folder and also they start to read more of the emails they are finding in in their inbox if it's not all over the place with advertising and so uh, we really can see an, an higher engagement and that's good and that's it best practice to send email to an audience which is 
highly engage with your email and um, also to send less if they are less engaged um, um, because uh, people are getting annoyed and uh, then maybe um, in best case let it in the inbox or click on unsubscribe or in the worst case click on the spam button uh, which then will lower your reputation so in in order to meet the expectation of get rid of unwanted mail uh, we really focus on what customers are telling us uh, we really focus on on their needs what signals they give us back from from emails um, to see how they engage with the emails and then just to filter out what has a low reputation to to our customers um, and uh, this really helps us to to increase customer satisfaction which is very important to us um, and at that point i want to flip sides a little bit um, i do also have some expectations um, to you as senders um, and uh, this is really to stick to the best practices um, we cannot tell it often enough um, that if you stick to best practices like sending to a highly engaged audience do your authentication right and uh, offer unsubscribe options we really can see that this is uh, beneficial for for you as a sender and of course for the brands you are sending on behalf of um, so i have a few points with me uh, as a takeaway uh, what you could do to help us uh, to make the email uh, uh, even better and to meet uh, my customers expectations which are all uh, which are also customers of your brands you are sending for so one is implement schema org uh, connie talked about it we want to to especially on on, on um, shopping emails and parcel deliveries we want to get out the right information to show them to the customers in a very convenient way also we want to custom uh, help customers to clean up their inbox if they if feel they need to so offer one click unsubscribe really make it easy for the customers to get rid of an email they do no longer want to have um, and then uh, focus really on the reputation of that brand so the domain the brand domain is really the driver for the reputation uh, with uh, authentication in place this is this is the main focus we spend on uh, to measure whether customers like an email or not uh, so uh, do your measure your reputation however you can and we, we will provide you information about that and, and, and do the best to have a high reputation in a highly engaged uh, uh, audience where you send to and of course implement DMARC like I said we are also in the phase of implementing uh, we will respect policies very soon and uh, please do protect the domains you are sending on behalf on uh, within accordingly DMARC policy that helps us to protect our customers and to increase satisfaction and uh, to measure reputation and uh, bring this all into place do go out and access data we provide of course with uh, data privacy in mind so it's a bit limited but we provide feedback loops and you as a CSA candidate can really really easy subscribe to them by just filling a email address into the clip tool um, and then you will start receiving uh, a feedback loops some hours later um, also, we provide um, uh, important data about the spam click ratio, for example, to the CSA back and the CSA just implemented an API for your senders where you can get the data from and really you can measure your reputation and you can measure what we see on your IP level and also on your DKIM level. So if you want to see it on your customer base, sending customer base, uh, make a separation of domains, give each customer uh, own DKIM signatures for their brand's domain, then you will get reputation information back and expect DMARC reports. Um, again, this comes down to implementing DMARC, so do a record um, request reports and you can expect them uh, to get from us 2021. I don't want to give an exact date, uh, but uh, we will for sure give you the data back again with data privacy in mind um, whatever we can uh, we will give you back so for me this is a cooperation um, we can give data back and we can talk to each other we can exchange experiences about what customers needs uh, what they expect what brands and senders need what they expect and uh, then to exchange uh, data to make it uh, uh, make it a better place and if we cooperate 
uh, we will for sure succeed in uh, um, satisfying customers and and not working against each other um, by by having the, the the fear that we filter out wrong email or stuff so it's it's a back and forth we need to give feedback we give data we collect feedback we can do it all through the csa which is a really cool thing uh, that we have it in place that we work together and uh, so cooperation is, is the key here to make it better and with that i'm finished with my part and i hand back to connie um yeah just one it's really just the last slide that um, contains more information if you want to know more about the schema.org implementations or any other uh, postmaster information you have um, the link up top and our contact details um, in the bottom but i would now open up to questions thank you yeah first of all thank you Anne and connie we already have some questions um i would like to start with the first one it was at the beginning of the presentation from Connie. 50% um, spam. Is the spam identified as spam and put into the spam folder, or is this mail put into the inbox and users then vote on it? I think it was at the beginning at uh, page four yeah, or five. Yeah, it's, it mm -hmm. um, it's put in the spam folder or even rejected. Anna would know more about that, but. Uh, for it's sure. not put in the spam folder. Re reject is not part of this figure. Um, uh, so it's, I'm if you say it. it's, yeah, it's 50%, uh, roughly 40 to 50% sent to the spam folder overall. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then the next one is the unsubscribe newsletter visible because the sender enabled one click unsubscribe, or is this a future from one and one? If last, the what does it do exactly? Uh, it's a combination of both. It's um, we listen to the uh, we, we look for the unsubscribe header, the, the CSA unsubscribe header. Um, and then if that's present in the email, we display the um, I should have learned how to switch slides easier. Um, let me check. Um, it's it's something so it, it's. It's right here. OK. Um, so it's a combination. So if it, if there is an unsubscribe header, um, we use that and we just use the link that's provided. Um, if there's no unsubscribe header, um, we have like, I don't even, I'm not even sure. Um, I think we have two other means of trying to detect the unsubscribe link from the email. Just like we, in all the smart inbox um, stuff, we try to use machine, or we, we not we try, we, we use machine learning um to actually find all these patterns um in the email so for example to find the shopping email and determine what is a shopping email and so we also use that to find the unsubscribe link if it's not if it's provided or if it's provided somewhere in the email but um then we have different measures to ensure that we don't show a wrong link um but then the feature yeah. of showing it up top is a feature from our client yeah and uh, maybe in addition to that <clears throat> um of course, we respect the the uh, uh, mandatory RFC for the one-click unsubscribe, and if it's present, this is the best variant we choose to put on this email. And uh, we also consider other options uh, like the non-one-click uh, version, where you jump out to a website to unsubscribe. Uh, we also uh, will investigate uh, if a mail-to option would be feasible for our needs. Um, but the best way, and also from CSA point of view, the uh, the mandatory way is a one-click unsubscribe. Yes. So the next one, do we know how many mailbox users confuse buttons for unsubscribe and spam complain? Since it's a different point in the UI, um, I, I'd say users are often more used to the spam button. <clears throat> because they know it for some years and the newsletter unsubscribe is in uh, is new and um, uh, maybe they don't they don't find it in the first place uh, but like i mentioned we re-ask if we know there is a one click unsubscribe and the customer clicks spam uh, in mobile as well as in big screen uh, we re-ask and so then he has again the choice 
Okay. Yeah, so if um, they try to click spam on newsletters, they um, we ask them, do you would you rather unsubscribe than just move it to spam? Okay. The next one, what is your opinion regarding Vimi? Is it safe? Is it a good practice? What is safe <laughs> in that regard? <laughs> yes, Vimi is a good practice. We are looking into it. Um, as you might know, we have a trusted dialogue which already shows brand logos. Um, so if you are really interested in having interested in having brand logos showed up right now, uh, we have trusted dialogue in place. We are also looking on um, how Vimi will fit into our product um, yeah, together with uh, trusted dialogue. That's what I can say. I think it's it, it can be done um, in a safe way. Um, for me as a receiver, the important part of it, the A, like the, the, the proposed standard requires, is a strong authentication uh, with a, a DMARC policy in place on the, on the org domain, uh, not on subdomain level. Um, and then reputation, it's all about reputation. If you don't have a good reputation, I would never show, show up a logo, even if everything else in place, because for sure one of the first adopters for BIMI and DMARC and DKIM are spammers or, or senders of um, may we consider it not good. Um, so it's everything is up to reputation. Um, features we only apply to mates from senders with a very good reputation. Okay. In days like this, Black Friday is coming. Does one in one have a delivery or order which May sender comes first? So customer may ex expect that all newsletter are delivered fast to not miss any burgeons. If yes, what are key points one in one decide or influences the order? I'm not sure if I caught the question right. The uh, order of the May? Should I repeat it? Yes, please. Uh, in days like this, Black Friday is coming. Does okay. one and one have a delivery order which mail sender comes first? So customer may expect that all newsletters are delivered fast to not miss any versions. If yes, what are the key points one and one decide influences the order? Okay, I think I, I got it. Uh, so if I really uh, got it correct, uh, you are asking whether we make it this uh, distinction between senders in terms of prioritization of the inbound traffic. Um, no, we try to always um, um, make it uh, fair for everyone. Um, for sure, there are, uh, there are rate limits on IP addresses, for example, and if an IP address is called, you cannot just start sending a lot of, uh, a lot of email. Um, so you have to warm correctly, but if everything is warm, if reputation is okay, um, you should be able to also send higher amount than usual. And we don't say, okay, Amazon is first and all these smaller shops are afterwards. We don't do this. Okay. I think that's a wide If I got it wrong, reach out to me um, and yeah. I, we can discuss, <laughs> discuss it later. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, we have two or three questions more. What's the best way to measure reputation with GMX Web Day? Is there a domain reputation or IP reputation that like what can be seen in Google Postmaster? Okay, um, so um, at the moment, uh, what uh, data we feed back uh, to the CSA to be accessed is uh, both. It's IP because the certification is IP based. Um, uh, you certify your IP, so all the measures and all the rules uh, to stick within applies on IP. So we give back the data on IP, but also on DKIM. Um, and um, at the moment, uh, the thing is that we only give back the outer DKIM, the last DKIM of the mail, which may cause uh, that it's not the brand DKIM, but the ESP's DKIM, for example. Um, but this we will fix very soon to give back the data in a new format for the CSA that you can access the data on every um, DKIM. So you can have both um, uh, domain and IP. And at the moment, you, you should also consider both um, uh, it's it's hard if you are in a mixed environment with a lot of other senders, then of course the main reputation is much more crucial. If you have a dedicated IP, um, IP reputation should be fine for you as well. But like I said, domain is the more important part. It's also the more important part to our customers. Um, the header from domain is what they see. Um, uh, so this is the important part. 
But to wrap this up, you get both ECAM domain and IP address via CSA. Yeah. I know we have more questions. I think that we um, need to answer them after the webinar. I will uh, discuss them with Connie and Anna and send you the answers um, afterwards. But um, yeah, I think that's the end for today. Many thanks to Connie and Anna again for the webinar today. Um, we are very happy that you also um, taking part virtual and um, that you were part of the CSA email summit. And dear attendees, I hope you enjoyed the webinar and um, feel free to feel free to check the next webinars. And um, we are also looking forward to your feedback. You get the feedback right after the webinar and hopefully have a nice day too and see and hear you soon. Thank you, Anne and Connie again.